This film was, like many of Wells' films, made without a great deal of money. Did that impinge upon the, the making of it for you? Did it make it particularly difficult at any point? No, I mean, we all, we, we all had contracts. We weren't paid, um, I don't know what Gielgud was paid, but um, I think I was paid £100 a week. I mean, it was 1964, uh, and also paid um, a daily, whatever you call it. Uh, and so, on, and Spain was incredibly cheap in those days. I mean, it was, one, Madrid was wonderful. I never realized uh, how wonderful a city Madrid was. In that time, I don't know what it's like now. I mean, the fact that it was under Franco, it was all very controlled in a way. I mean, when Norman Rodway and I were walking down the Grand Via, people stopped and stared at us, not in an accusing way, but we had long hair. Mm -hmm. And nobody in Spain in those days, the men all had short hair. And um, we stuck out. But uh, it wasn't... Um, <laughs> we ran out of money just before Christmas, and um, most of the uh, work had been done. But I said to Orson, I'm, I'm not being paid. Uh, I'm being paid, you know, my salary hasn't come through. So he said, I, he was terribly, I hated that I'd said it afterwards. And I went to the producer, and I said, and he said, Senor, about it. And he pulled out his pockets, like a sort of to show they were empty. He said, I have no money. But he said, um, I will pay you. When I get money, I will pay you. And sure enough, that was um, December. And the following, uh, I think, May, I was told the money had arrived. And I, w I was given a check. I'd never seen a Spanish check. It was a huge check with a lot of zero. So I don't think. Um, I don't think any of us felt, I mean, all our food in the hotel, it was all provided for. I don't think we uh, felt that we were not being paid properly. We knew it wasn't a Hollywood movie, but we were paid decently. And mm. was there ever any discussion about, because obviously Gielgud in particular was renowned as the great Shakespearean actor. And was there any sort of discussion about, oh, but this is how you should read your lines? Oh, or? no, not at all. No, in fact, um, there was not much rehearsal. Uh, we rehearsed for the camera. There's a scene in the tavern right at the beginning. Uh, normally in a film, either the actors move or the cameras move. But in the first scene in the tavern, when we're accusing him of, you owe me money, Sir John, we're all moving. We're moving around the camera, and we, we rehearsed that all day. But most scenes we didn't rehearse at all. I mean, uh, and certainly with Gielgud, I mean, the long soliloquies. I mean, he just stood there and did them. No, 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 we were never given, never given um, directorial ideas at all, I think. Well, we weren't. I think we, it made it very happy, of course. You, you, were trust, you felt you were trusted. Oh, actors. yes. Yes. I, I mean, I think we all felt, whoever you were, whether you were Gil Good or Jean Moreau, who was a great... One all felt that one was in the hands of somebody who was a great director, obviously, Citizen Kane. So we just gave ourselves into his hands, which is a wonderful way to work. I mean... If you're an actor, you can be mucked around by a director, and uh, you know you don't want that either. But uh, Orson never did that, and he, he loved, he loved actors. I mean, he loved being an actor himself. And he, he once said to me that um, I was going to direct a play. He said, you know, directors have to be a different director for every actor. And um, he said a director is probably the biggest acting job of all because you can't. You know, you can't reveal if things are going badly. You've just got to get on and do it. When we ran out of money, um, it was around Christmas, and everybody else had gone. He wouldn't let me go to England. I don't know why he thought I wouldn't come back, I suppose. He said, you can go to Morocco. Go to Morocco. It's only 40, mi 40 minutes away. As long as you promise to go to American Express every Monday and every Friday and see if there's a message. And I went in Tangier, everyone. There never was. And then one day it said, the money's arrived, come back. So <laughs> I went back. 
Now, this, I think this is one of the great Wells films as well as one of the great Shakespearean films. And it has a, a depth of feeling that Wells himself admitted to. I think he often said that it was perhaps his best film. And he clearly identified very strongly with Falstaff or, or had a very strong connection somehow with Falstaff. Yes, he felt... Can you talk about that a bit? He, well, he did feel that... Um, I talked earlier about the death of Mary England, and he felt that Falstaff was the representative of that more idyllic time, that Falstaff was Mary England. But he also, um, after everybody had gone, or practically everybody had gone, and we were driving to the set, when he said, um, it's much sadder than I meant it to be, he said. It's not, the funny scenes aren't as funny as I'd hoped they would be. And there, there are no sort of really summary scenes in it. And we were passing a meadow where there was a tree in full flower. I said, well, why don't we shoot that little scene that we, we'd never shot? He said, it's too late. It's too late. The film has taken on its own. I think we were all, everybody liked each other. That's the point. I mean, everybody respected John Gilbert. We were all very proud to be. And, you know, he was... I mean, the, the public image of Olivier and Gielgud was that Olivier was kind of a matey, blokey sort of person, and Gielgud was aloof and, uh, well, he wasn't. The reverse was true. He was very silly, Sir John, not foolish, but he was silly. I mean, he was famously, um, in, the, in the war, uh, he wasn't called up because of his feet and his age or whatever. But um, there was a society man called Chips Chan and gave a big lunch party. And there was a map, a huge map, of where all the Nazi armies and the Russian armies were in red and black and the British were in, French, were in blue. And Chips Chan came and said, my God, what have you done? He said, he said, you've got the Russians in Ireland, you've got the Nazis in Tunbridge Wells. And John said, yes, but it's so pretty this way. <laughs> <laughs> so he was much... I don't think you'll ever find, when actors get together of my age, uh, who've worked with Gielgud, I mean, they're just, the stories are endless. Judy Dench, Maggie Smith, you name them, they will all talk about the fun they had mm -hmm. working with Gielgud. Olivier, well, I never worked with Olivier, but he wasn't quite so fun as uh, John was. Mm. Do you think there was, Wells had this, long-standing desire to, to do something around full staff right from his teenage yes. years. What, yes. what was it that he personally found so fascinating, do you think? I think that he felt, first of all, that it's a wonderful, wonderful role, and very often it's played for comedy. Um, and there is a lot of comedy, actually. I don't agree with Orson. I think he's very funny, and I think it's extraordinary that he can get laughs being the fat man in a tin, and next moment you're terribly moved by the death of Hotspur. Um, I think he just felt that it was, well, I'm sure he felt that it, it was such an extraordinary role that you could do things with it. It explores almost every emotion, and he felt that Falstaff was a good man, really. He felt that Shakespeare had written a good man, not just a likable man or a funny man, but a good man. And I think the film, I think film, because you can film in close-up, I find it, watching today, um, when uh, I re renounce him, and he's on his knees, and he wore his makeup for when I was doing my speech, normally a director, if you're not in that scene, he could have stood behind the camera and I would have been made up and then he'd dress up for his return. But he dressed up for my scene and knelt in front of the camera and it made it extraordinary. I mean, he loves long, low shots so that the king's image is <coughs> shot from below and then the reverse. I find the, the um, look on uh, Orson's face, Falstaff's face, when I reject him, I find that close-up of him 
incredibly moving because he's hurt, cruelly hurt, but at the same time, he looks at me with a sort of pride. That's, that's my boy. He's come into being the king. And I, there are many touches like that. I don't think we had, any of us thought it was going to be as moving. We didn't think either that it was going to be such terrific fun. It was really wonderful fun. I mean, we started, uh, in, in, when we started in October, the weather in uh, that old castle, because that's where we, we did those two days with Sir John, uh, how now my Lord of Worcester, and then mostly it's a double for Sir John every time you see the battle. But then we went up to do the royal scenes, and lunch would happen. We'd start working about 9 o'clock, I suppose, when we'd got there, and lunch would happen when Orson felt like it. And we'd all sit out of doors, and they'd bring food, and there were lots of stories. Uh, Gielgud and, and Orson would... You know, it was just one. And then afterwards, they'd clear the food away, and Orson would lie on the table and fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd all go and do the crossword or, or something, and then he'd, <laughs> he'd wake up and say, Right, work. And we would work, and we'd work till later. Nobody ever complained. The only problem in working in that um, castle was where to find a loo. There were no, no loos. <laughs> so, um, and it was quite difficult because we were all, I, mean, I had to wear three layers of tights because it was so cold. So it, it wasn't easy. And um, the crew found their own place where they all went. <laughs> And Sir John would wander off to have a pee, and he, he often was wearing his crown, and you'd see him disappearing with the crown on. And once he came back and said, oh, I'd found such a wonderful place, and there were four nuns squatting there. So, I mean, that was, um, you know, it was an old castle, and they didn't have plumbing like that. I can't think of a single instance of direction that he gave me, either in the film or on the stage. And yet, I know my performance, his imprint is on every inch of it. But he wasn't a, direct, a dic dictatorial director at all. And he never showed off about being a director either. I mean, he was. A lot of directors, believe me, I've met a lot of directors now. And a lot of them like being directors. And they're sort of authoritarian. And he had so much more talent than any of them, and he never bothered to show it off. One just did what he said, but he didn't. The only time when I, when, um, I was doing my confrontation with the king, when the king is accusing me of whatever, and I had to say, do not think so, you shall not find it. I will redeem all this on Percy, he said. And uh, Sir John said, oh! And, oh and, uh, we were doing just the run through of the camera. And um, oh, he said, I'm so terribly sorry, John. Keith, I'm terribly sorry, Orson. And Orson said, I don't mind. What do you want to say? And I said, I don't mind, Sir John. He said, well, just breathe at the end of the line or on the punctuation. If you lose that and lose the iambic pentameter, you'll lose all the sense of what you're saying. And if you don't, if you do breathe, you will find that Shakespeare's verse, it's like a surfboard. And I think that's almost the only piece of direction that I received. But one was conscious all the time that um, who was in control. I don't know, I wish I could tell you, yes, he said, do this or do he never, he never did. The scene in the tavern where the camera was moving, and that we re did rehearse all day, yes. But no, he never said, and, and, or to anyone, well, I'd like you to try it a different way, never. No, there was no sound. Hmm. We were in location, there was no sound. In, in, every line of the film is dubbed. I dubbed in, um, and the sound was variable when it first came out. I mean, they've done a wonderful job on it. But I dubbed in uh, three different studios in Madrid. Um, and I also dubbed in London and Wardour Street. 
I went to Paris to dub with Jeanne in Paris. She was doing a film. Sir John dubbed in New York. He was doing a place. So there is, and it's been wonderfully improved, but there was a certain kind of discrepancy when it was, because we shot without, um, without sound. We sh I mean, there was a, a, a recorder there to record what we were saying. But we were all, they were real, the only set was the tavern scene. But that wasn't really a film set. So the sound was, you know, all had to be dubbed. And it was, it was quite fun doing it. And Michael Aldrich, who was a wonderful actor who played Pistol, he dubbed Worcester. He dubbed um, one of the uh, odd soldiers. I mean, it was very larky. I mean, we all, we never thought we were making a masterpiece. We all thought we were, hoped we were making a good film. But we knew we weren't working in the same sign of circumstances if we were at Pinewood or at MGM in Los Angeles. It was, and of course, I think the film, I think the film shows that. What it doesn't look like, which I mean, when I said earlier, when, John said, what about Keith's hair? It's going to blow everyone. Orson said, it'll just look real. And I don't feel when I'm watching that that I'm watching a costume movie like the Olivier films, which are wonderful. But they're very, and they date. And I don't feel that, that this film has dated like that. Very often you can see a film that was made in 1947, and now you can see it was made in 1947. But the simplicity of the clothing uh, lent a great deal to the to the movie. It's interesting because I mean, you you say that some pieces were dubbed. You didn't actually dub other characters, but you did, in effect, play other characters occasionally because you were the one. Oh, I played. I mean, if you weren't there, you see, Sir John was only there for three weeks, and every time you don't see his face. I mean, when I hold up the crown and say, now we call, we had, and the kings, it's not Gielgud at all. But uh, Orson was a wonderful magician, and magicians know how to make you look at the wrong thing. So when I'm holding the crown and they're all kneeling down, that's not Gielgud, he's on Broadway doing a play eight times a week by then. And there's, um, every time you don't see uh, Justice silences face, it's me. I'm, I was doubling for him. And every time you don't see Margaret Rutherford's face, it was one of the crew, short, fat man, who was in, um, that's, that's, but it didn't upset one at all. Uh, and there is a scene where, after Wells pretends that he's killed Hotspur, and there's Hotspur on the ground, and I'm never, and they see the king coming. Well, Sir John shot all those faces before he went to America, much earlier, and with also saying, look here, look there, John, look cross, look there, look there. But in the actual scene, you would notice, if you were looking, that that's not Norman Rodway as the dead Hotspur. That's a, that's a double. And that's not Sir John walking through either. It's his double. And the only person, it's me, it's my face, and it's Orson's face. But that's the brilliance of being a magician. Magicians will make you look at what they want you to look at, so you don't see the tricks.